Welcome everybody to week four of Devtoberfest. Uh, things are really flying by and here we've reached uh, the midpoint of the event. And uh, for this week, we have the security topic uh, to share with you. We're very excited to bring you uh, this week, which is a little, which is a little different than uh, maybe some of the other weeks that are very focused on particular technologies. Uh, security is something that is a pervasive topic that runs across many different, well, really should run across all of our technologies, right? And impact everything from the way that we design our applications, build our applications. So it's much more than just, you know, something that we throw over the wall and the security admins take care of for us these days, right? Um, and with that, uh, to kick things off this week, uh, we have Cedric. I'm going to turn it over to you, Cedric, to introduce yourself and your topic. Very excited to see what you have to uh, teach us this morning about passwords and how you can use them to stick it to the hackers. Um, so with that, uh, welcome, and uh, I'll let you uh, take the floor. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so I hope that you will be entertained by the topic I would like to talk about, which is named Hackers Want Password. It's subtitle. Then let's give them passwords. So what I hope is that this presentation will give you some inspiration on things that we are not currently doing, but that we could do in order to turn the balance more in the favor of defense. So my name is Cédric Hébert. Uh, this work is being done in a, a research team with my colleagues, uh, Marvel Sahin and Anderson Santana de Oliveira. And yeah, let's jump into the topic. So just a, a few words about uh, who I am. I am working for uh, SAP Security Research. Actually, I just uh, celebrated my 20th anniversary with the company, which, uh, well, when I joined, uh, starting working on security, I could not imagine that 20 years later, I would still do security and love it. So that's the fact I'm there. And uh, since a couple of years now, I am headed a topic which is called active defense. And uh, the main idea is to use actually uh, the idea of deception, so of lying as a means to move from defense to something which is a bit more proactive. So deception is something which has uh, used uh, uh, since ages in all types of fields. It started with uh, actual war. Uh, and uh, well, now, now the idea is to move that to the cyber world. And since, uh, well, why should we not lie to attackers, right? So here in this topic, I will talk about uh, fake passwords, deceptive passwords that we can use to uh, balance things from uh, a more active uh, defense point of view. So why that? So my uh, starting point was to look at the state of the cloud, meaning that we are uh, moving more and more in a world where um, all applications are made available uh, from the cloud, which is very great for an accessibility perspective and which brings a lot of advantage, but it also um, increases the attack surface. So if you look at a report from Verizon from 2020, uh, then they mentioned in the hacking section that uh, hacking is, uh, well, about 90% of the time uh, done against web application, uh, which is composing what the cloud is offering. And um, also very worrisome is that about, uh, well, 80% of all those initial access uh, against the application was done by using a credential, one sort of credential, either brute forced or stolen via phishing or whatever. So this report is from 2020. The report from 2021 just uh, is available now. I looked at the numbers, but they are basically the same. So I didn't feel the need to update the slide. Right, so, okay, so now we have a big problem because, um, well, it looks like from an attacker perspective, then there is this door and they want to adore the door, which is our web application. And so they say, okay, how can I open the door? Then, uh, well, uh, maybe I will just look under the mat and be lucky. And there it is, there you have your password, you have the key and you just have to enter the key into the uh, door and you are in. And so the question that I ask myself is that, what can we do against that? Is there a way that we can, by using deception or any other mechanism, 
uh, avoid this problem. So we know that attackers are looking under the mat to take keys, right? So since we know that, why not use that in our advantage? So the question that I wanted to ask is, what if this key, which was under the mat, that I will call the red key or the square key, instead of opening the door, what if it would ring the alarm and shut the door tight? So you would have your real key with you, the green one, the round one, that would open the door. And on purpose, you put a red one under the mat, just in case somebody is attacking you. Because who else would look under the mat and try to enter uh, beside adversaries, right? Or maybe your kid, but well, that's another story. So you keep the, your own key with you, and the other one will ring an alarm and shut it tight. And so I was wondering whether we can apply that to uh, cloud applications. And so if you have a look at the different uh, method of compromise, so this is another source from TrustWave, um, then you have this, this breakdown again from 2020. And you see that, again, a large majority of all those elements are related to credential one way or the other. So the exception is basically a application exploit that we'll, we will not discuss uh, today unless you have specific questions, but I don't plan to go deep into this. And the others category, which is basically all the things. Right, and then let's just have a look at uh, weak passwords to start with. So weak password is something that you all know, uh, is that, uh, well, despite the fact that we are having uh, password policies, then there are users who are using weak passwords. It's the fact. So against, uh, by abusing this, uh, this type of attack, what can an adversary do? So let's see that. So here you have on the, the screen, on the right side, you have a web application, which is a cloud hosted. And on the left bottom, you have the list of users with their passwords. In clear text, it's for you to see them, of course. Well, normally, nobody has access to a clear text password. But what you can already notice that in there, uh, well, several passwords are rather weak, uh, namely the one of Doris, which is uh, very similar to a very common password that is being used, uh, well, uh, very frequently. And so as an attacker, what can I do if I know that I am attacking this particular application and uh, that the, the best to maximize the chance of attacking and having a valid uh, password, I will use something which is called password spreading. What is this about? I will show you in a second. So basically I come up as an attacker with a list of um, username and weak passwords. So instead of trying to brute force one particular account by with 10 different passwords, I will just use the same weak password and spread that over all the accounts. So it maximizes my chance of finding one account, any account with a weak password. So in this case, you see already that in the script, then we have the valid combination for uh, Doris and initial two. But now we know that adversaries, they are using weak passwords for uh, managing to break into applications. So can we use that as a red key? That's exactly what we will do here. So as an administrator of this small prototype, I can enter in my database, in my only passwords table, the password which will be password one exclamation mark. And that's it, it's just in place. And now I will run the script. So I play the role of Alice. Alice will be my attacker and Alice runs her uh, brute force attack. It will execute the script, and then it will try those different uh, login password combinations. So this is what happens. You see them being uh, tried one after the other. And on the right side, you see that all those password uh, tentative fail, including the one which should have succeeded, because as I told you before, Doris and initial two is part of them. And if you look, it's there, Doris initial two. So let's have a look at the logs at what happened actually. So here we could see that the, uh, we detected that the uh, uh, user, Alice, was trying to use password one exclamation mark as a password and we denied access. But furthermore, we could actually ban Alice from doing anything else. So here we, we ban her based on her uh, the fingerprint of her user agent uh, and her IP address, you can have any kind of banning strategy, but this one uh, can work. And here we say we see that Alice uh, has actually found the correct credential of Doris, 
but we just pretended that the password is incorrect. And at that point, Alice will have no way to know whether it was the real password or not. And of course, we will send an email to Doris to say, hey, someone managed to guess your password, please change it. Right. So this is the, the idea. And this is what I just showed you. Why can I just, yeah. All right, so as a summary, we just used password one exclamation mark as a red key, and it immediately managed to shut down Doris from uh, the, the Alice from uh, impersonating Doris. Okay. So now you can say, yeah, but okay, weak password is only 6%. Uh, can we do more? Then let's look at the next category because I think, yes, we can do more. The next category is called credential stuffing. So this is the most popular uh, way to, to break into application. So credential stuffing is based on the fact that people tend to reuse passwords across accounts, either the same exact same password or a password which is rather easy to derive from the, the one which has been leaked. So if you are able to modify your password to login onto different websites, then the attacker can do it as well. Let's again have an example. In this picture, you see um, someone who is publishing a database leak or a part of a database leak, which happened on Tumblr. So actually, this is a quite a, this uh, screenshot has been taken a while ago, but uh, well, in 2017, actually, if you look at that, but uh, by a coincidence, Tumblr has been leaked again uh, a few days back. So maybe this is just coincidence, but yeah, so. Now those people who are, uh, they, they manage to break into the Tumblr database and they still username and password, either in clear text or in this case, they are hashed. And so they want to sell this. They want to make money out of it. So what do they do? They will look for people who are ready to pay for this uh, password database. But of course, as a buyer, how can you trust that it is a real leak? Well, what the attacker is doing, exactly like it is the case in this, uh, in this space bin, they are just um, giving away a subset, a free sample, basically, of uh, username and passwords so that you can test whether this is uh, valid or not. And here, as an administrator, what I, we could do is to get access to this list. And uh, instead of paying, we will just look at the free content and see what happens. So here, as, a, as an admin, I have retrieved the free sample. And I am looking whether there is anybody who used uh, the SAP email account. And I see Charlie. So here, maybe Charlie reused the same password, maybe not. So I could crack it. But in case, just to be sure, I will lock his user account. So he's on the database because it's work in progress. But what happens is that now, uh, um, Dory, um, uh, Charlie, sorry, receive a password reset link. So he will just uh, copy paste that. And he said, okay, uh, we say, okay, uh, we want you to reset your password, please set up a new password. So of course, with a new password, the account will be uh, unlocked and Charlie can connect again. But the twist is that the old password, instead of completely uh, removing it, we keep that as a red key. So now Alice, our attacker, she managed to find three username and password in the full database leak that she has bought. The one from Bert. So you see, she got access to the application. There was no way we could prevent that. Then Charlie, and she is using now the old password, which is now a red key. So we say invalid username and password. And she also stole the username and password of Doris. But again, it will say invalid username and password because it was exactly like the demo before. So now again, if we look at the logs, then we see that, uh, we see an event for Bernd that he managed to log out. It will be highlighted in a second. There it is. And then we see that when the Alice tried to log in as Charlie, then she was denied access because, well, she used a honey credential. And uh, then she, when she tried to log in as Doris, then exactly like the demo before, well, we detected her as malicious. So we just pretended the password is incorrect. So here you see that we could block the access uh, against Charlie's account and Doris's account. We could not block the access against Bernd's account because it was done before she used one of the uh, Honey passwords. However, if you look at logs, then it should not be very difficult to identify that Bernd's account has been compromised as well and fix it. So here, 
the important thing is that we'll get the alert immediately instead of it being delayed uh, for, for weeks or months. Today, uh, we have a, a big problem as defenders to identify an adversary. Um, well, on average, uh, a user can, an attacker can stay in the system uh, about 200 days undetected. So the numbers are decreasing a bit, but not that much. But with such a sign, well, you would immediately jump on what happened and probably identify that Bernd's account has been compromised. All right. So now we looked at weak passwords and uh, credential stuffing. But the real elephant in the room, of course, is this one, is phishing, social engineering. I am putting as well Meshus Insider. Why that? It's because, well, it's not very easy to make the distinction when somebody logs in uh, with a phished password or if it's a real user, uh, whether the account has been compromised or not. So we have to put them into the same uh, basket. The thing is that we will consider that it's always um, an account which has been compromised by an adversary. We always give the benefit of doubt to the real user. However, uh, from a defense perspective, is you see that this user get hacked re at regular interval, that of course it will raise the suspicion, but we will deal with them in the same way. So here, um, what we have thought about, which was use the red key to block, will not be enough. Because in this case, since we are talking about a phished password, then it will be the real password. So here we will be able to, uh, to the adversary will manage to break in. And so we will find a way to, to detect it at some point, but at that point, it's too late to block because the attacker is already in. So here the twist is, what if the square key, instead of shutting the door, what if it was used to trap our guest? So this is a carnivorous plant, by the way, which is trapping our adversary. And here the idea is to let the adversary think that he is inside, but he is inside a trap. So let's see how we can do this. For this, I have another demo. So here it starts by uh, Alice, which manages to fish Evan's password with a very convincing phishing email, which is basically telling, please give me your password. So um, Evans has a very strong password, but since he will give it, well, it's game over, right? So due to an error in blah, 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 please give us our pass your password. And of course, I would fall for such a phishing so easily. Oh no, here is my password. Right. So at least now what she does is that she just uses the username and password. And of course she's in. However, it's rare that an adversary will stop here. I will pause for a second. Alice is an adversary who will uh, now has a foot inside the application. However, this is just the initial access. The goal of the adversary will be probably to steal a lot of data. So at that point, if our adversary just is happy with the data of events, then probably there is nothing that uh, this solution will bring. But if Alice wants more, like for example, find a vulnerability to hack the application to get a full dump of the database or uh, remote code execution so that she can pivot to other machines, then here we have our chance. Because now she thinks, oh, I am inside, I will uh, search for vulnerabilities inside the application. Let's see how she is doing this. So here she's opening the uh, de developer tools and there is a very interesting cookie here, which is called isAdmin. So isAdmin is set to false. And well, it happens in certain applications which are poorly defined, that you have such a flag, uh, which is saved as a kind of cookie or any kind of a client side storage. I hope that you all know that this is very bad to do this because you should never trust the client. But here Alice says, okay, I will try my chance. And she's turning this admin is false to admin is true and trying to refresh. And then what happens is that she is actually trapped. So here we change the page to clone honeypot. You see that it's the exact same session. Uh, of course, in a real case, it would not be written clone honeypot. It would just look exactly the same. But now what we can do is that instead of feeding her real data, we can feed her fake data, but in a way that it will be hard for her to detect whether the data is real or fake. Again, this is another uh, topic on which I'm working that I don't plan to really go into details unless you have specific questions, but this is the general idea to make it completely invisible to her. 
Okay. And now what we know as well is that those adversaries, they don't come only once, they come regularly. And they can also work in teams, so they can share the password with other people. So now we have detected that Alice did something malicious. And we sent this reset email to Evans. So here, well, let's imagine that uh, Alice is logging out for now. And now Evans is receiving this email saying, hey, uh, somebody has uh, done something very fishy with your account. Please reset your password. Like before, he will uh, use the link and change his password. And like before, the old password will be kept um, as a red key. The only difference is that now, instead of just denying access, we we'll use the red key to again trap Alice. So Evans logs in with a new password, everything works fine. And when Alice comes back or uh, one of her accomplices is using the same password, she does not know that the password has been changed. And actually, when she submits, she's, uh, she has access to the system. Which is um, which is good because now we did not raise the suspicion that the account that the attack has been detected and that the uh, password has been reset. If we just blocked access, we would maybe try to find another account or move target. But now she will continue to be in the clone, thinking that the attack is still valid and the access is still valid. If we look at the logs again, so here we see that the user entered a valid honey credential for the user events, and though we granted access to the honeypot instead of declining access, right? So for this to work, actually, we use something more than just uh, the honey password. We needed something more. So here, um, a little bit of explanation of what happened behind the scenes. So for this, I said that we want to be able to route the adversary uh, out of the application and inside our honeypot. So in order to do that, in front of the application, we put a reverse proxy that will be able to detect, to decide whether to route the request to the application or to the clone. We added a, a cookie, a deceptive cookie uh, inside the proxy, which was this admin equal force uh, cookie. So of course, this is just an example. You can imagine any type of traps or things that would be enticing for an adversary to play with. And once the admin equal force cookie was modified, then the reverse proxy tell told to the IDP, please lock this user. So this can be done directly uh, because here uh, a simple uh, uh, REST call to an interface which, has, which is exposed to the IDP would do the trick. Of course, you need to modify your IDP to do that, but not very complex. However, the other uh, thing is a little bit more tricky. Here we want the IDP to be able to say to the reverse proxy, please trap this session. So I have identified that the red key has been used, please trap. However, there is no direct link between the IDP and the reverse proxy. Everything is going through the web browser because here uh, the IDP is identifying the user with a Java web token, so job token. And so this job token is transiting through the browser. So there is no direct uh, connection. So how did we solve this? Here is what we did. And uh, well, we think it's a reasonably neat solution. If you think it doesn't work, I'd be interested to hear about it because then we'll need to fix it. Okay. So we created basically a magic job token. How does it look like? So first, let's look at the red, the, the green key, the round one, the real one. So JOT uh, tokens are uh, made of three parts. The first part is a header. Uh, I will not talk about that uh, because it, it's not very important here. The second part is a payload. So this is what you see in green, ID3, username is events. So the payload is a number of claims that the identity provider will make about the user and that the application can use to do a number of things. So you can put anything you want in there. Here, it's sufficient to say that the username is events to, for the application to treat the user as events. But of course, if it was just this payload, then anybody could just craft a, a token saying, I am admin and let me in. So in order to prove that the uh, payload came really from the identity provider, once the user properly authenticated, then this is signed. So how is it done? Uh, the payload is being simply hashed by the IDP, and then it is signed by encrypting with the private key of the IDP. So, the signature is the part at the bottom, this SLFKX whatever. 
and this is given to the browser. So when the job token reaches the browser, which is the second column, the browser receives the token like this, ID3, username is Evan, and the signature. And then the browser, to authenticate, it will forward this token to the proxy. And then the proxy will try to verify that the token is valid. It, it really comes from the IDP. How does it do that? It will hash again the payload, ID3, username is Evans. And then it will compare this hash with the value it obtains by encrypting the, so decrypting basically, the signature with the public key of the IDP this time. If the two value match, it means that the payload is valid so that the signature is also valid and then uh, that the claim can be trusted. And then it can send the request to the application, right? For the red key, it's a bit more tricky. So what we do is that simply at the IDP level, when it detects that the username is logging with a username and password combination will correspond to red key, then it will again create a job token, but it will add this payload malicious is true and it will hash it. So exactly like a normal token, it will create it exactly in the same way. The only exception is that of course, when it sends that to the browser, it cannot leave the part which says malicious is true because there the, talk, the uh, adversary would just look inside his browser. Oh man, I've been detected as malicious. So he would know that he has been using a honey password and just ditch the token, not use it. So what it does is just, it strips this, but it keeps the same signature. So from the adversary's perspective in her browser, well, nothing special. It looks like a normal payload and a signature. And she has no way to know whether it's the signature which corresponds to the payload or not. And then this is forwarded to the proxy. So now the proxy is doing exactly like before. It will hash the payload, decrypt the signature with the public key, and then it will realize that there is a mismatch because of course the content of the payload is not what was hashed, what was signed, sorry. So uh, it, will, it will not work. However, at that point, before uh, throwing away the token by saying it's invalid, it will think, oh, maybe it was a malicious user. So what the proxy will do is that it will add this malicious is true part to the, to the payload, hash it again, verify. And this time, if it works, now it knows that actually the token has been created by the, by the IDP to say, hey, this user managed to log in with a red key. So at that point, signature is valid and the request can be sent to the honeypot again. So at that point, we basically uh, run through the do not. And this is what I wanted to cover uh, in this uh, rather short presentation. Uh, I just have a, a conclusion slide and that's about it really. So again, the idea was to raise awareness of what we can do with just a little bit of deception. So here, as a takeaway, you can see that with Honey Credential, first of all, we can increase the detection speed. As I told you, it's today one of the major problems that we are having uh, because attackers, they attack, but there is not much uh, that lets us, well, we, we, are, uh, we tend to not consider uh, as important information that we are under attack because we are, okay, we are just sustaining the attack. But with Honey Credential, we can detect immediately that we are under attack right now. And the interesting part is that we can act immediately. So we can immediately react instead of waiting before it's too late. So um, what I claim, it's a bold claim, and I know it's a bit, uh, it's a bit too strong, but I'll say that by using Honey Credential, Honey Active Defense, basically, we could prevent up to those 75% of initial intrusion. Of course, it would be the case if really attackers play the game, uh, some of them will uh, manage to fish and not play with our cookie or any of the trap that we managed to have. And of course it will continue to, to be inside. But what I'm claiming here is that using uh, those deceptive elements, it's a small thing to add, but it's an extra layer. So you are, will not be less secure by using this. You will only gain a, a few alerts which will be too positive. And now back to my research and what I'm doing with my team. This is my roadmap for active defense. First, alert, second, divert, third, confuse. So the alert part is already, uh, I, I hope now it's already clear, is to put some layers here and there so that 
every time an uh, adversary stumbles upon them, we immediately know about it and we can react very fast. Only sending such an alert would be already a dramatic way to reduce the detection time, which is very too slow even today. The second part is a direction. So you have seen with this uh, honeypot clone, instead of blocking, which would mean for the attacker, okay, I will try something else. I will use another account. I will find another exploit. Then as long as we keep them diverted and that they are not sure whether they have been trapped or not, or they don't think they have been trapped, then while they are there, they are not doing anything else. And of course, uh, you can also uh, look at what is happening there. So there are many benefits that, again, I don't want to go too much into details because I'm afraid to go over time. I could talk for hours about this topic, by the way. But more important is this number three, which is the confused part. And I think this is something which is really under, um, uh, under addressed today, even by companies who are doing uh, cyber deception. So the idea is to say that my, my, my wish is that eventually adversaries expect applications to be protected with active defense uh, items such as honey passwords. I want them to expect them because when that's the case, then of course they will be a bit more wary before attacking because they will try to avoid the traps. But it can be a good thing because now, next time an attacker manages to break into an account after using a weak password, I want the attacker to think, was this really a real account which has been compromised because the user was using a weak password or was it a trap? Am I being trapped right now? And same thing when they see something like a cookie, I want them to think, oh, maybe this is a trap. I will not touch it because I don't want to be trapped or detected. And if we manage to have this type of thinking into the attacker mind, it means that they will refrain themselves from abusing some real vulnerabilities that might be there. Because the example like the cookie, it's something that I've already seen in my life. Maybe so, not so trivial and so not visible, but something similar. And, uh, and the, the cool stuff as well is that Maybe the att attacker will manage to break into the system, see some data, but he will think, no, it's too good to be true. It has to be fake. And again, it will diminish the return on investment for them. And my hope is that when next time they see that this application is protected with active defense, they just turn it off and look at another target to attack. That's what I wanted to say. This is my thank you slide, and I would be happily trying to answer any question you may have. Well, excellent, e excellent presentation. Uh, I learned quite a bit myself. Um, and we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, let me start by relaying those and, and anybody else is, is free to, uh, to add questions in the chat. I'll relay them to Cedric and we can discuss them here um, interactively. Um, but maybe to start off, we there was a little discussion in the chat about uh, background resources or, 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 uh, uh, like where, where do you go to research these sort of topics your, yourself? What are some good, whether websites or books that, that people can, um, uh, that you'd recommend to people on, on this topic? Ah, on this topic, so yeah, uh, good point. Actually, I don't think there is much. Uh, it's this is this is also why why I wanted to to present something about this topic about active defense. So of course, while well, there is my own research, but I think that as uh, uh, well as a technology uh, people working in technology, this is something that would be very beneficial for all of us, and something which has been quite. Uh, underappreciated for a long time. Because if you look, for example, at Honeypot, this is a rather old technology, but I think it, it, it is a uh, thing that people think, ah, oh, it's something from the past, or it's only for detection of malware, but these are myth. So I think now people just start to understand that, no, you can actually do something interesting with deception. Uh, so in terms of resources, not so much. Uh, most of my inspiration comes from uh, research papers. Uh, that you can find on Google Solar. Um, beside that, honestly, there is not much. Uh, we actually, my, my colleague, Merve, uh, her name was on the first slide, uh, is currently working on um, setting up a, a workshop uh, to 
bring people from the industry, from universities, uh, to, to even from the psychology field to join and uh, start talking about this. So this is something that we would like to, to develop as a, as a topic of interest and that we'll try to, to spearhead. But now today, um, well, there is one, one company that I could recommend. Uh, I know, I'm not sure if we are supposed to do that because we're SAP, but, <laughs> but they're very good and they are doing something for free. Uh, the, the website is called canarytokens.org. Uh, the company is called Things. Uh, they are actually giving you a lot of ideas of things that you can deploy for free uh, in terms of uh, uh, honey token or honey things, honey documents, whatever. And they have a blog, uh, they are having a blog, which is rather interesting. So maybe start with that. And of course, well, uh, follow me on Twitter <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I am regularly talking about this. Yeah. All right, next question. And, and I, I'm gonna modify this. Well, I'm gonna add on to this question. So, so Steve uh, from the chat asked, now let's put this in the context of SAP's own applications. How close are we seeing this sort of functionality being built into the standard applications? And then maybe I would add on there a follow-up question. In your mind, is this the role of the application developer that this functionality should be built into the application? Or is this something that should come from the underlying infrastructure? That's an excellent question. Uh, yeah. So, well, it's difficult to answer. So I think that today it's a little bit of both because uh, there they are things like, for example, if I, uh, I mentioned this, uh, this trapping mechanism with the identity provider. So probably as an application developer, unless you are working with the IDP itself, uh, there is not much you can do, right? So it would be more a requirement for them to do that. As well, uh, all this um, uh, concept of, the, of a reverse proxy that would add this uh, fake cookie and detect things. So it could be seen as a, as a platform service. So actually, this is something that I would like to try uh, to make that available as a service where you could have be as a, I don't know, a customer, you could define your own traps and uh, monitor that. Um, however, it's also interesting to consider this from the developer's perspective. And I think today, I still need a little bit of help from the developer uh, itself, himself. Um, Namely, in the, the part that I did not discuss here, but which is about building the clone. Uh, so for that, you need to create um, this fake data that will populate your database. And uh, we are working on a, a concept which uh, is about uh, using machine learning and anonymization technique to actually use uh, your productive data and create out of that believable fake data. Mm. But this model needs to be trained. and. Uh, probably the best person to train this part would be the developer today. So I would see that as part of the kind of CI CD pipeline, but how automatic would this be? Probably not 100% automatic because uh, the person who is developing the content of the database should say, this column is public data. This column uh, is uh, should never be uh, disclosed. This column could be merged, whatever. So there mm -hmm. is a little bit there. And another aspect that I found interesting, uh, unless you want to cut me, no problem, uh, is, in how to best position those uh, fake tokens. So here I mentioned the cookie, but there are other things which are more interesting that you could put into place. And in my opinion, the most effective ones are the ones which are really bound to your business logic, like uh, something that only you as an as a architect or as a developer, you could think of, for example, when you are doing your threat model. And so this is the best uh, moment to gather ideas of what to deploy as effective traps. So. Again, I think it's a little bit of both mixed. Uh, yeah, this is my 10 now. Uh, I don't know whether my mind will evolve, but this is what I would answer now. It's interesting when you were talking about the, the clone generation, um, immediately my mind went to some of the topics we had in the previous weeks of, of how CAP and RAP both allowed developers to model you know, at an abstracted layer and that would be an interesting addition to the modeling syntax is if you could just add in a few of those rules and just like cap and wrap both generate the draft tables, for instance, they, they could draft the, or they could uh, generate the clone honeypot as, as well. Uh, so that's, that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting thought. Thanks. I can, uh, I'll keep that in mind. Okay. Um, so John asked a question that I think, based upon our conversation before, and he, he well, he, he didn't so much ask a question as he uh, 
he brought up the capture the flag security games uh, uh-huh. and how they're a lot of fun and useful to the organization. You were mentioning the same beforehand. Maybe <laughs> maybe share a little bit about that with the with our viewers. Oh, uh, you want me to talk about the capture the flag? Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, John, uh, from a general uh, from a general concept for for developers learning about um, about security, is there some? Yes. Uh, yeah, just share a little bit there. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Actually, yes, I'm a capture the flag enthusiast. Uh, I wish I had more time to to, to play those games, but uh, yeah, this is definitely a, a, a good way to to first of all uh, have fun and learn a ton. So actually, I am learn, so the the idea. Uh, Bridging back to the topic of active defense is that you will want those, those things to be uh, realistic from an attacking perspective. So you need to have this type of knowledge. And capture the flag events uh, are an extremely uh, good way to do that. So you have different types which exist. So you have a ton of such uh, things that you can find online. Uh, there is a, a website which is called ctftime.org that is uh, listing all open capture the flag, so there is always something to do. And there are many websites actually which offer uh, capture the flag uh, um, activities such as Hack the Box, namely, so have a look there as well. And SAP is organizing his own uh, capture the flag during uh, the whole most of October. So it is running right now, but it's SAP internal. And if you are from SAP and want to play those things, I highly recommend that they are extremely good and interesting. And so uh, the idea of a capture the flag exercise, so you have different types. The, the most popular one is called Jeopardy, is you have a, a small challenge to, to to execute. Usually you have to uh, program something or find a vulnerability and exploit it. And then you retrieve something which is called a flag, uh, which is hidden. So usually it's uh, just a file inside the desktop of the machine, which is hosting the application, which is vulnerable, and that you report into a scoreboard and then you are uh, giving a rank, whatever. You have all the types of capture the flag, but this one is the most popular. And actually it's interesting that you mentioned that because uh, for the second year, um, I have actually developed uh, a challenge, capture the flag challenge, for the SAP uh, capture the flag uh, uh, event that I am using for fine tuning this research. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I will not say more because I don't want people <laughs> to, to to see it. But basically, uh, the the one that we did last year, um, there was a. Um, um, I, I wanted to, to, to have an idea of how much uh, uh, people we could catch with only tokens. And actually it was, uh, yeah, I think more than two thirds of the players uh, fell into our traps. So we did not say that they were traps. And actually in the end, the clone was exactly like the real system because we did not want them to, to be uh, surprised by this. We just wanted to know if our traps worked and they worked quite okay. And this year we have something even more fine tuned, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Very nice. Well, we do it. We we have a security challenge this week as part of DevToberfest, but it's to fix some some bad code that that has uh, like SQL injections and stuff like that. But maybe for next year, we'll have to uh, think about doing a, a capture the flag challenge as part of our security week. Be so fun. actually, yeah, bo- both are interesting. So it's true that historically, the capture the flag, uh, the, the most popular ones, they are, have been focusing on the attack part, but mm-hmm. more and more we see some also defense which is coming into the, the picture, and I really uh, think it's great. So I think it's, it's good to have a little bit of both, right? Yep. So, yeah. Very nice. Uh, next question was also from Steve. Um, he brought up, uh, he wants to know your view on something here. Uh, for instance, Microsoft is uh, readily allowing you to turn off your password. Um, in the Windows OS and instead using other authentication mechanisms like the fingerprint or the face ID. Uh, What do you think of that? And how might your techniques translate to these other authentication setups? Excellent question. Uh, So they are good thing and less good things. So it all depends on how they are set up. Um, For example, the the, the fingerprint on the iPhone, it's great because, uh, well, the the iPhone, you have it with you. So it's not something like you send your fingerprint over to the internet and then it is computed or whatever. So they they are good and bad uh, things. It's true that entering a password is cumbersome. And uh, yeah, so anything which which ease up this fact is... uh, is interesting, but again, I would see that on a case-by-case uh, basis, and uh, and see from there. So 
yeah. Uh, this being said, so I think the question, uh, uh, so it's not the first time that I hear this question and it also goes into the direction of, uh, yeah, um, if I am using, um, I, I don't know, uh, a, a YubiKey or whatever, then do I still need your thing? Uh, the answer is simply yes, uh, because if you are using multi-factor authentication, then of course it is harder to uh, hack your account, but does not mean impossible, right? So uh, it's true, it will probably be I would say less useful because it will be less attacked, but there are still ways to steal your password even if you are using multi-factor authentication. So actually, multi-factor authentication is really helpful mostly if you are um, uh, reusing your password. So against password, uh, uh, um, sorry, password, uh, credentials uh, stuffing, uh, that was the second attack, or a weak password. Because there, somebody who guessed your password or found it in another leak and using it against your uh, account, which is protected with username uh, with second factor authentication, you will get the message and then you will probably not go through. Probably, because yeah, you can also be convinced to do that. But against phishing, uh, not so sure, because the phishing website can be very clever and actually reroute you to this second factor thing. So you think that you are logging inside uh, against the real thing. So you will happily enter your second factor authentication token as well. So I would just say that, of course, I started with passwords because this is very common, but this is just, uh, if you have something else, then it just moves the, the target a little bit uh, farther. So the conclusion is do not use this as a replacement for having second factor authentication, but use it on top. All right, very nice. And I think that's about all the questions that we have at this time. I, I put out kind of a, while you were answering that last one, I put out a last call for, for questions and I haven't received any more. Um, so just about on time here, we'll, we'll be able to, uh, to wrap things up. Um, I hope everybody's enjoyed the sessions today. A um, little different look at security where normally we'd look at the nuts and bolts in, in a particular programming language. And we wanted to, this week to, to really broaden people's horizons on what security means uh, and, and open up some of these other research and, and uh, interesting uh, topics. And we'll continue with that throughout the week um, uh, with a great panel discussion tomorrow, uh, container security on Thursday. Wednesday, I'm going uh, uh, to do a session on a cloud application programming model and ABOP security that ties directly into the security challenge. That will be more program language uh, specific and uh, uh, focus on SQL injection and, and, uh, and how to properly set up authentication in our particular programming models. But we also have a list of tutorials of this week that cross over many different technologies uh, in the SAP business technology platform and how to use different security mechanisms within the, the various technologies. Uh, so we encourage you to check out all the different aspects of, of the security week of Devtoberfest. Um, uh, but, uh, oh, let's see, did we get a few more questions? Uh, got a couple thank yous, very nice presentation, very enjoyable. Uh, we got those as we went along, interesting session. Um, uh, so once again, Cedric, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for bringing your perspective as a security researcher at SAP and, uh, sharing, uh, this very interesting look at, um, how we can protect our systems better. Excellent. So the pleasure was really mine and, uh, I will be looking forward to the next session, which look very interesting. So thanks again. <laughs> all right. So join us back here all week long for more of the security topics. Until then, thanks everybody for joining. Thank you.